Good morning. Welcome to WHVC TV. I'm Dr. Tade Boboy, the lead pastor of Wemmer Heights. This morning, I greet you with Christ's joy. This is a day the Lord has made, and we have made up our mind that we're going to rejoice, and we're going to be glad in it, despite what the week has been. This is a day for the Lord. This is a day of the Lord. This is a day for us to give Him glory, and all the praise, and all the honor that is due Him. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times, in good times or bad times, I will bless the Lord at all times. And His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. We're glad that you've come to join us in the praises of our King. Our risen King. Christ is risen. is still risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome back to our broadcast. As we go back to part two of our message last week that we've titled, And Peter. And Peter. Peter, we begin to examine what, what the message of Christmas, uh, the message of Easter uh, mean, meant for P Peter and what the message of resurrection meant for us in the here and now. And we begin to talk about the two implications of the message of Easter. Number one, your failure is not final. Your failure is not final. That's where we ended last week. Get a pen and the Bible. Let's go deep into the Word of God, and I'll give you the second implication. Invite a friend. I'll come back and pray with you. Receive the Word and Peter. In the game of basketball, one of the most important skills for players to have is the ability to rebound. When a rebound has to be made, it tells you that a shot has been missed. Hence, there's no need for a rebound unless something has been missed. And if a shot has been missed, that means a shot has been attempted. And good coaches will tell a good shooter that it's okay to miss a shot than not attempt to shoot. Just as nothing ventured is nothing, no pain, you're tracking with me now. But one of the reasons that shots are missed in basketball games is because the opposing team is in a player's face. For example, it's the job of Joel Embiid. It's the job of Joel Embiid to wave his huge big hands in Kawhi Leonard's face and obstruct his view so he can so he can miss. Now, you can't imagine Kawhi Leonard missing a shot and walking up. To Nick Nurse, his coach, saying, Coach, I need you to go talk to that huge seven foot monster out there for me. He's been bothering me all since the game started. Every time I tried to make a shot, he put his big, nasty hands in my face. And I can't see the basket, so I'm missing my shots. Can you go tell him? Can you go tell him to stop? Can you go tell him to stop putting his nasty hands in my face? How many of you think... <laughs> how many of you think Coach, Coach Nurse will say, Okay, I'll go talk to him beat for you, quiet, to stop bothering you. Or it's more like he's going to say, Look, quiet, <laughs> there's a reason we're paying you $18 million US a year to shoot over any monster. And if you miss, go for the rebound. In bid or know him. No. A good player won't walk off the court and quit the game or throw in the towel just because they missed a shot. A good player will go back out. And rise as high as he can get for that rebound. 
so to get the ball and shoot again. Come on. Help, help, help me to start preaching this message. Look at the person next to you and tell him, go for that rebound. Go for that rebound. Go for that rebound. As we come to our text this morning, my brothers and my sisters, we find a disciple named Peter who has missed a lot of shots in the game of his life. He didn't even have the gumption to face Jesus after all his missed shots. I mean, how are you going to face the one you've denied? It's like when I was a kid and I did something bad. And my mama says, wait till your father... Yours was like that too? Oh my goodness, I thought I was living in a highland. Wait till your father gets home. Do you think when my father comes home, I go running to him, Daddy, Daddy, oh, welcome Daddy. Good to see you today, Daddy. What did you bring for me? Or it's more like I'm going to go into hiding. How do you think I'm going to face my father with confidence when I know what wait till your father comes home means? Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? And just how do you think Peter is willing to face Jesus after he heard that the risen Christ calls for him? But go and tell my disciples and Peter. How, how, how do you think Peter is willing to face Jesus after, after he heard that, that, that the Christ that he denied is risen? Oh, I'm trying to help you understand the impact of those two words. Mary, in verse 7, that the angel gave to the women. But go, tell the disciples and Peter. It was as if Jesus was saying to Peter especially, after he denied him, Oh Peter, I still love you. You may be faithless, but I am still faithful. You may have denied me, but I cannot deny myself. You may have said you will be my ride or die. And when the ride stopped, you left me, but I still died for you. Is there anybody in here grateful that even when you are faithless, he is still faithful to you? And I began last week by sharing with you two implications of Easter message. Of what Easter really meant, of what Christ's resurrection really meant to Peter and men and mean to us. So that we just don't want to stop Anytime we miss a shot, Auntie Mabel, we don't want to stop anytime we miss a shot in the game of life so that we don't just stop at the foot of the cross. <laughs> we, we, we believers are so notorious for this. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and we stay at the cross. And we don't just want to come and peep into the tomb either but i want us to understand that when jesus got up the bible says i got up with him when he got up you got up with him to oh somebody's not hearing me this i'm saying if i didn't just come to tell you that he got up that he rebound what I want you to see this morning as we continue is what does his getting up mean for my life? Not just for my eternity because I know because he lives I can face tomorrow. That I know. But what does his resurrection mean for my life in this nasty here and now? 
That's what I want to know. Oh, I've been singing louder than unbelief. The unbelief. I believe that is reason. That's why you're singing your hallelujah. But what does it mean? So, so, so. The first implication of Easter that I gave you last Sunday is, put it up. Your failure is not final. Oh, that's good. Write, write that down again. If you, if you went here, write it down. I say your failure is not final. Oh, that ought to tell you something, love. You may not want to hear it, but that ought to tell you something. That sooner or later, you're going to fail. Oh, I, I, told you, I told you you didn't want to hear it, just as Peter didn't want to hear it. Can I take you deeper? I told you I didn't have time last Sunday, so, so now I have time. Let me, let me, let me work more on, on this first point. You know how the enemy, listen to me very carefully. You know how the enemy will try to take something that you did and use it to convince you that what you did is now who you are? It will convince you that because you failed, you're now a failure. Because you divorced, you're now a divorcee. Because you flunked out exams, you're now a dummy. See what the accuser of the brethren did to Peter. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 14 verse 72 that immediately the rooster crowed the second time. <laughs> That's a Canadian rooster. <laughs> African rooster don't crow like that. It will wake the crap out of you. Okay. That, 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 when I heard that, I go, man, who is that one going to wake up? That's a Canadian rooster. The, the, the Bible said, when Peter heard the rooster crow the second time, Peter wept bitterly. He began to weep. Now understand, Lady Sherry, that the reason Peter wept when the rooster crowed wasn't because he had failed at that moment. That wasn't when he failed. But he wept because he was now convinced at that moment that he was a failure. See, Chris, it's one thing to fail. And it's another thing to let the enemy convince you that you're a failure. The rooster came to convince him that he's a failure. Watch this. Oh, this is good. This is good. This is good. This is good. What Peter had forgotten was the plan Jesus told Peter he had for him in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. When Jesus says, this is why you've got to dig into the scripture. Oh, this is so good. Give me Luke chapter 22, verse 20, 31 and 32. When Jesus says, Simon, Simon. Stop there. Understand that whenever God calls your name twice, it means trouble. Moses, Moses! Jonah! Jonah! Adam! Adam! <laughs> Thank you. You all know where I'm going. Has your mother ever called you by your middle names whenever you've been bad? Whenever my mama says, Taiwo, Ademola, Adeyemo, Ibirako, Alexandra. I know it's, it's time to run. <laughs> <laughs> now, earlier, Jesus has already changed Peter's name from Simon, which means pebble, to Peter, which means rock. Why is Jesus now calling him back by his old name? Simon, Simon. Anytime you read in the gospel, 
where Peter is called back by his old name, Simon, you know it's been bad. <laughs> or it's about to do something crazy. So the Lord Jesus says, Simon, Simon! Behold! Watch out now. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, has demanded permission to shift you like a wave. Good God of heaven. Oh, oh, there's so much in, I could teach you in that verse alone. Did you know that Satan, that, do you know that Satan can only do what is been permitted to do to you? Go ask Job. If you belong to God, Satan can only touch you if he's got permission to touch you. Otherwise, he has no authority over you. That, that's why you don't have to worry about who's messing you up. Or who, who wants to mess you up. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a rhema word for somebody right there. So Jesus says to Peter, in advance, Simon, Simon, I know how messed up you are. I know your proclivities. Some people say that Peter wore peppermint, peppermint socks. The way he loved to keep his foot in his mouth. Jesus says, and Satan has demanded permission to jack you up. Verse 32. But I pray for you. But I pray for you, Simon. That your faith may not fail. Ooh, I love the next statement Jesus made. It blew my mind. And when you turn, when you rebound, when you've got the rebound of your shot, your missed shot, strengthen your brothers. Oh, somebody missed that. Because I feel like shouting right about now. You know why I feel like raising a hallelujah? I feel like shouting. Because not only did Jesus predict Peter's failure. Not only did Jesus prophesy Peter's defeat. But Jesus also predicted and prophesied Peter's rebound. And Peter's victory. That even in his failure, his faith will not fail him. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. I don't know who this message is for. But I just want to speak to somebody here today who feels like a failure like Peter, that even though you fail, don't let your faith in God fail. Even though you fail, but from now on, whenever you hear that rooster crow, give me that rooster crow one more time. I want you to look at that rooster. The next time you hear a crow, I want you to look at him and learn how to speak back to your rooster and say, hey, Mr. Rooster, you can crow all you want, but my Jesus is praying for me that my faith will not fail me. Hey, Mr. Cock and do 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 Hey, Mr. Cock and do do You can crow all you want, but my Jesus says, my failure doesn't define who I am. What God says is what defines who I am. Because I already have a word from the Lord. And his word is, when I've turned back. Oh, meaning, Dickon. Jesus says, I'm a bounce back. Come hell or high water. Meaning, Jesus says, he knows I'm going to fail him. He knows I'm going to have dark days. He knows I'm going to say some stuff and do some stuff that I'll later regret. He knows I'm going to miss some shots. But when I've turned, not if I turn, not if, 
Because not only did they predicted the defeat, but he also predicted the victory. When I turn, oh, I feel like somebody is turning back to God on the second Sunday after Easter Sunday. I feel like somebody has made up your mind that this morning will be the last time you will listen to that rooster crow. Tell the person next to you, no more listening to rooster crow. No more listening to rooster crow. Mm. But he might listen. He might listen to my Jesus spoken word to me. Because I know my failure is not final. G -g 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 give me the life point. Give me the life point. Give me the lifeline. I may make mistakes. But I'm no mistake. You make mistakes. But you're no mistake. If that word, if that word was for you, go ahead and give the Lord your a a hallelujah praise one more time. Somebody shout, I'm turning. I'm turning. Woo. Do, do. <laughs> see, I'm trying to help you see that there's a, there's a resurrection power in those two words and Peter so you can know that if you fail Jesus like Peter your failure is not final oh, don't get me wrong if you fail confess it I'm not saying you shouldn't confess it confess it but isn't it good to know that our God's grace is greater than all our sins? Oh, come on, somebody. C come back next time. Come, come back next Sunday. I, I say, isn't it good to know that even before you messed up, God's word to you is your failure is not final, but his grace, his grace is going to be the final word in your life. Oh, come back next time but sadly sadly Peter after his denial of Jesus had forgotten what the Lord had told him would happen so that the next time we see Peter the next time we see Peter in the pages of the Bible, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Which brings me to the second implication of the Easter message. The second so what Jesus got up. I haven't given you this yet. Are you ready for it? Whew. Number two. Your life is not futile. Ooh, that's even gooder than the first. Because if your failure is not final, it's only logical to conclude that your life is not futile either. I say the implication of the Easter message is your life is not pointless. Because I came to tell you, if your life was pointless, Jesus would not have left the glory of heaven, Lord, to come and die for a pointless life. Who's going to die for a pointless life? But oh, he was born into sin <laughs> that I may live again. <laughs> Oh, I'm talking about the precious lamb. The precious lamb of God now. Maybe I should call up the Wellman Praise Choir to come and sing, Behold the Lamb of God for you again. What I'm trying to say to you is, so what you had that divorce? So what you got dumped by Freaky Freddy? So what you got fired after you worked your tail off for that company? All that don't mean your life is pointless. The devil is a liar. Amen. All that means is pick yourself up and begin again. Amen. Oh, maybe I should bring Dickie Neal to come and testify to you. He 
if you know what we're about to read in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, the question you'll be asking is, why can't we end the Gospel of John with the resurrection story of Jesus coming out of the tomb? Much like Matthew and Luke did, Dr. Luke did in their Gospel. Why are we coming back to Peter? Again, I mean, <laughs> what we are about to see in John chapter 21 is, is so bad at first. Bad. Bad. And I have to wonder, I say, my goodness, you want to finish your gospel on a hand note. Matthew finishes with the ascension of Jesus. Luke finished it with the ascension of Jesus. John came back to Peter. After Jesus rose from the dead, why don't you start? Why don't you stop on a high note? Why come back to Peter? <laughs> so, the question is do we really need this section of John chapter 21 in the Bible? Can't we just fly into the book of Acts and into the ascension of Jesus? And right into the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit broke out. Why do we need another story about Peter? To finish the gospel. There's an answer to that. And the answer is the Bible wants to show us that the second message of Easter is our life is not futile. Woo! Oh, yeah, no, only at the Mabel is feeling me. Look at what Peter did after the resurrection. Look at what Peter did. Verse 1 of John chapter 21 says, After these things, after what things? That is after the resurrection. This is the post-resurrection now. Jesus had already risen from the tomb, from the grave. Jesus manifested himself. Who? Jesus is still manifesting himself to right now. I said, Jesus is here manifesting himself to somebody in the mighty name of Jesus. Because this is still your year of manifestation. Hallelujah! That's why I told Dickin, don't, don't put that tomb down. We think Easter is just one Sunday. Easter is every Sunday. Every Sunday when we gathered here, we're reminded that he's risen. Because Peter, Paul, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if he was in reason, our faith is in vain. Why we gathered? Jesus manifested himself again. That's the word again to the disciples. Meaning he had already appeared on several occasions to the disciples. But this time, it's about to show them his glory at the Sea of Tiberias. That is the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. In fact, thinking, Jesus had told them, as we read in Mark chapter 17, 16, to go on ahead of him to Galilee and wait for him on the mountain. But where did Peter say he was going in verse 3? Give me verse 3. Thank you. Somebody already went ahead of me. Sister Sarah, know her Bible. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going. And everybody said, we're coming fishing with you, Peter. Now, what I want to know is, how is go wait for me in Galilee? And I'm going fishing related. They don't sound like the same to me. Talk to me somebody. If you look at the Greek text. What Peter was really saying is. I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to what I used to do. You know I've been a big failure as an apostle. So what's, what's, what, what's, what the heck? What, what's the use? I'm going fishing. Sister Liza, that's futility talking. 
Have you ever found yourself going back to the way things used to be? Back to the same old, same old you've been delivered from. But deep down inside of you, you know ain't nobody can do you like your Jesus. Because he keeps manifesting himself to you over and over again like a hand of heaven that won't let you go. Oh, I wish I had me some rending witnesses in this place like Peter. Shout no turning back. So the Bible says in John chapter 21 verse 3 that he, Peter, went fishing with some of his fishing buddies and all night they caught nothing. Lord have mercy. Deja vu of Luke chapter 5. Have you ever gone fishing and caught nothing? <laughs> Many times in my fishing days, I used to love to go fishing. I haven't done that in a very long time now. Ah, life has been so busy. But many times I've gone fishing and I've gone out and caught nothing. And the temptation, Dickon, to walk away after you've been waiting for just one big fish to bite. The temptation to walk away is so great that, that your miracle may just be around the corner. A a any fisherman here? Bear me a witness. I, I, I must say any fisherwoman here too. Because I've got to be political correct. They say whatever a man can do, a woman can. <laughs> I, I didn't say that part, first part. Why are you putting that first part in it? Messing up my line. Dickin, they will tell you the temptation is great. You know, you can be fishing and you go, okay, you know, by 11 o'clock, you go like 6 o'clock. You start fishing early in the morning. That's when the fish bites. And you go by 11 o'clock, I'm going to come home with a nice supper. And, and, and 10 o'clock, you're still not catching anything. The temptation to quit is real. But if you're a fisherman, you go, okay, let me wait another 30 minutes. It's going to come. Another 30 minutes might take you to 2 o'clock. Because you know the miracle the biggie might just be around the corner. Each time I came back home from fishing, Lady Miriam would ask me, did you catch anything? Because she's been, she's been getting the stew cooking for fish. After a while, I get, it gets so embarrassing to be asked, did you catch anything? So one time on my way from from, from home, I, I stopped by the Chinese store <laughs> to, to, buy, to buy some fresh fish that looked like the catch of the day. <laughs> I, 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 and I said, here, Marian, here, Marian, here, Marian, the catch of the day. Well, I wasn't lying. I wasn't lying. That's what the label on the store says catch of the day so 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 if she didn't ask me where i caught it from i don't tell <laughs> don't ask hello somebody I'm, I'm going somewhere i'm going somewhere with this and the bible says peter fished all night and caught nothing so that when he said he was going back fishing it was because he felt defeated and felt this, his life was pointless. But I want you to tell somebody next to you, don't go back to the way things used to be. Don't go back to the way things used to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't go back to the way things used to be. G give me the lifeline, Sierra. You're doing well. Give me the lifeline. Because he, he, here's this. You've got to write this down. You've got to write this down. Don't put a period in your life where God puts a comma. Woo! That, that's a good word for somebody here. 
I, I don't even know who I'm talking to because I came to tell you that the message of Easter is not only that Jesus is alive and has defeated death, hell and the grave, but he also defeated anything that threatens to defeat you. Ooh, somebody shout yes! I say the message of Easter is not only did he defeat death, hell and the grave, but he said I would defeat anything that defeats you. Why are you going to put a period, Peter, where God is putting a comma? And it dawned on me that there's a reason, Nancy, why John decided to go back to Peter. Even after an epic possible conclusion, the resurrection, what, what can be more epic than that? But really, the message of the Easter is not so much that Jesus got up. The message of Easter is to let you and I know as Peter that if Jesus could get up, Peter say, God, God is, Jesus is saying to Peter, if I can get up, Peter, get up! This is the resurrected king resurrecting Peter. And this morning, the resurrected king is resurrecting somebody here today in the mighty name of Jesus. He's bringing things back to life in your life that the enemy has declared dead. The devil is alive. See, if you ever move away from God's plan for your life, you will end up like Peter, catching nothing. That's the promise. But if you hold on to Jesus, Stephen, I say, if you hold on to Jesus, you will see your divine manifestation in Jesus name oh I'm a witness I'm a witness do I have other witnesses in this house this morning because my God is not a man that he should lie to you Peter Jesus has already prophesied to you in Luke chapter 22 verse 32 that he says he prayed for you you think Jesus is going to make a prayer that won't be answered he said, but Peter, I pray for you that your faith may not fail. And you, you, once you turn, because you're going to turn, strengthen your brothers. Not take them back fishing. Come on, somebody. No, not take them. Do you? Do you, do you see how you could call Peter any name you want? But he's still a leader. You could call him a failure. Lady Sashi, one thing you won't call him in is Peter is not a follower, he's a leader. In John chapter 21 verse 3, he said, I'm going fishing. And six other disciples said, we're going to go with you too, Peter. Call him anything you want. But one thing I appreciate about him is a leader. Leader leads. Oh! But oh, watch what happened to Peter. Watch what happened to and Peter next. Oh, I love the word of God. I love the word of God. This is so juicy. Tell your neighbor, juicy one is coming. The juicy one is coming. Juicy one. <laughs> Look at what happened to Peter next. Look at what happened to him. It, it, it looked bad at the beginning. But it gets gooder. Because every day with Jesus. I said every day with Jesus. is sweeter. Can I have a testify? Can I have, can I have some witnesses in this place? You ought to quiet for me this morning. Look, 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 look. I, I, I got to hurry up. I'm almost done. I, I don't want this to go to part three. God forbid. 
Winston already warned me. He said, Pastor, we don't have any more room in the, in the back here. If you keep doing part two, part three, we're going to run out of room. <laughs> Jesus is now waiting for Peter and his fishing bodies on the seashore. Let's fast forward. Look at verse 9 of John chapter 21. And so, when they got out of the land, when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and a fish placed and fish placed on it and bread. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Somebody missed that. The fishermen had not yet come in yet with a fish. Couldn't catch a fish. So how did the fish get on that frying pan? Somebody holler divine manifestation! Nobody even bothered to ask Jesus where did the fish came from. How are you going to ask the one who took two loaves, five loaves of bread and two small fish and it makes a smuggler's board for 5,000? How are you going to ask him where did the fish came from? Somebody holler one more time. Divine manifestation! Jesus is cooking breakfast, fish, and bread. Watch this, verse 9. Verse 9 says, around a charcoal fire. Wait another second. Ooh, the light is going on in somebody's head right now. Where else have we seen that word, charcoal fire, last Sunday? The word charcoal fire is only used twice in the New Testament. Here and in John chapter 18 verse 18 where Peter was warming up in the high priest courtyard before he denied Jesus. Now help me out. John in narrating this account Chris could have just told us that Jesus was cooking fish. But why did he go to the length of telling us the detail that he was cooking fish over a charcoal fire? I'll tell you why. John wants to show us that Jesus was cooking over a charcoal fire because the Savior is getting ready to take Peter back to the place of his failure. Just as the rooster crow will bring him back to the place of his condemnation, but this time the charcoal fire will bring Peter back to a place of restoration. Woo! Because Jesus already told him, You, when once you have turned back, I got a job for you. Oh. Oh, I'm not getting some help in this place this morning. So that by one fire. And Peter who said, I don't know him. Can now say by another fire. Lord, you know I love you. So that by one fire. And Peter who denied Jesus three times. Can now by another fire. Be restored by Jesus three times. Oh, I feel like shouting all by myself right now. Oh. Jesus says to Aunt Peter, verse 15, Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Verse 15, do you love me? Do you agapeo me? More than this. Do you love me more than all this fish? Do you love me more than all these nets? Do you love me more than all the things the world can offer you? And Peter said, yes, Lord. 
you know I feel like hold you. Ah. Don't miss that. Jesus said, do you agape hold me? Do you love me unconditionally? Or you love me because of what I give you? Do you love me for who I am? Oh, Peter, you told, you told all your boys, if anybody jinx you, I'm going to be with you till the end. Do you still love me like you said you love me? Peter said, Lord, I'm not going to go there anymore. <laughs> I, 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 I don't love you like I said I love you. Otherwise, we won't be in this. But I feel they hold you. I love you like a brother. Isn't it good to know that your Savior will meet you at any level that you are in so he can bring you back up to the level that he wants to bring you? Jesus said, okay, okay, Peter. Okay, Peter. If you feel it, hold me. Tend my lambs. Go back to what I called you to do. If your failure is not final, then who has been telling you that your life is futile? Not me. Go back and feed my lamb. So that three times Jesus asked Peter the same question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Why three times? Is it one time enough to, to ask a question? Let me ask you. How many times did and Peter denied Jesus? So watch this. For each time he denied Jesus before the crucifixion, each time Jesus restored and Peter after the resurrection. Oh, that's grace. Oh, you are not here. I said, that's grace. It's not every day that you will find someone who will give you a second chance. Much less someone who would give you a second chance every day. But in Jesus... I said in my Jesus and Peter found both. Is there anybody in here who needs the grace of God to do it again? Grace to be a good disciple of Jesus again. Grace to be a good husband or wife again. Grace to be a father or mother again. Grace to be a good co-worker and ministry worker again. Oh, grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse with it grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all somebody who's thankful for the grace of god go ahead and give him your graceful praise right now Thank you, Lord. I got to close. I got to close. I got to close. I got to close. You, you got to come back. You got to come back. Ah, you got to come back. The next time we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. See, we haven't even gone to the book of Peter yet. Next time we're going to start chapter 1. But before we go to the book, I want you to meet the man. So when you begin to read, oh, 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 I'm going to show you something soon. But, but when we go to chapter 1 of 1 Peter, you would hear Paul, Peter, you would hear Peter tell you about how amazing God's grace is. So that when you read, give me first Peter, stand up on your feet. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. When you read, worship team, come up. When you read, Paul says, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to preach that one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who according to his great mercy, somebody heard like great mercy. mercy. Uncountable mercy. Innumerable mercy. He said, has caused us to be what? Born again. To what? A living hope. Look at your neighbor and say, you got hope. Oh, talk to somebody and say, I've got hope. I got hope. I got hope. Thank you, Lord. You're still wondering what the message of the resurrection is? You're still wondering what the message of Easter means to your life? Chris, read it again. Who has caused us to be born again to a living hope? The one that the world would have considered a miserable failure, Sister Willet, will later write First and Second Peter to book in the Bible. The one the world would have considered a bomb will stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach a fiery message. So fiery that, that the, the place was shaken and 3,000 souls got saved in one service. You call that a failure? What did the message of Easter did for, his, for, for Peter? And what can it do for you? It will give you a living hope. See that? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the message of Easter. Omar, your failure is not final. That's the message of Easter. They can tie. Your life is not futile. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, oh Lord Jesus. Our life is a living hope. Yes, oh God. Wow. Welcome back. Welcome back. I trust you were blessed by that rhema word, that ingraftable word, that indestructible word, that everlasting word of God that is able to give us hope and make our hope come alive. Hallelujah. That's what we've been talking about this morning as we talk about the two implications. Two implications of the Easter message. Number one, your failure is not final. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that even when I fail, God already knows that I'm going to fail and he has made a provision through his grace that my faith will not fail me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the second implication, I get so excited about this. The second implication of Easter is your life and my life is not futile. Our life is not futile. Our life is not pointless. Our life is not useless. Just because we fail doesn't make us a failure. I make mistake, but I'm no mistake. Woo! I hope you receive that word. I didn't just come to tell you that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. I didn't just come to tell you that he got up. I came to tell you that because Jesus got up in the mighty name of Jesus, you too will get up in that situation, in that predicament, in that failure, in that setback, because your setback is going to be your comeback in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and hallelujah and hallelujah. Woo! I get excited when I think about the goodness of the Lord and His wonderful blessing through that power of resurrection that because He lives, I too shall live. Why not I quickly pray with you right now that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord, you will receive Him because He's come to make all things new in your life. And if you know Him and you backslidden and you failed Him, I want you to know that God is not finished with you yet just as he wasn't finished with Peter let me pray with you father in the mighty name of Jesus I pray for that person right now who's watching this message father if they don't know you that they will confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and they will believe in their heart by faith that you died 
and rose again for them. Father, I pray today that salvation will come into their heart. Salvation will come into their house. Salvation will come into their soul and their spirit even now. Thank you, Jesus, that for this reason you came, that we might have life and have it abundantly. And so, Father, I pray that that person today will give their life to you. And Father, if they know you but they're backslidden, I pray that today, today, Father, they'll come back to you. They'll get back in the game and know that their failure is not final and their life is not futile. Just like you did to Peter. Good God that you are. We're so grateful to you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Continue to strengthen us. Continue to bless us and continue to keep us. For we ask all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. Listen, if you receive that word, I need to hear from you. Comment at the bottom of your screen. Let us know how much this message was a blessing to you. Because when you're blessed, we're blessed. And we want to glorify and praise God for you. Hallelujah. i also like to invite you to come and be part of one of our services here at Wormer Heights. We're located on 1687 Victoria Park Avenue, south of Lawrence. And I'll give you the best seat in the house. Woo! Next Sunday, yeah, next Sunday, May the 5th, is our Friendship Sunday, our open house, plus our 67th anniversary as a church. We want to come, we want to invite you to come and celebrate with us. It's going to be a wonderful time. We're going to have a Yabadabadu time of celebration in the house of the Lord. The Teen Challenge Women's Choir are going to be in the house. Reverend Norm McLaren, former host on 100 Only Street, is going to be our guest speaker. I want you there. Refreshment is going to be served at the end. It's going to be a great evangelistic service. Invite a friend that you've been trying to reach. God bless you. I love you. And I hope to see you again as we continue in the study of the book of First Peter. Hope alive. Amen. <laughs>